Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our uh, collection conversation uh, this afternoon uh, with Kita Alfred. My name is Kevin Jones. I'm with the FITA Museum at the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising coming to you live from downtown Los Angeles. And I'm very privileged to uh, host today and talk with a fantastic costume designer uh, who has worked on a, a story that is um, uh, very um, um, deep and um, unknown. It's something that I had not ever uh, heard much about and talking with her and seeing the film has opened my eyes to an entire community of women that I didn't realize even existed in today's world and the things that they have to go through and how it is that they navigate their, their sartorial world, the actual the garments that they wear. And Kita Alfred is the designer for the film and I'm very privileged to be able to interview her today. Um, we have one hour to, to talk with her today. And if you have any questions as we're going along this conversation, uh, please feel free to include them in the chat. And if we're able to um, add a few at the end, um, that would be fantastic. Uh, I do want to introduce right now, um, Kita. She is a costume designer who hails from Manitoba, Canada and has spent over 35 years in the film industry. She studied theater production at Ryerson University in Toronto, which is now Toronto Metropolitan University. And after working in theater and large scale musicals, she turned toward film and television design. Her interest in anthropology, psychology, art history and architecture influenced her work. Having spent many years traveling, Kita became interested in the stories that people's outer layers tell about them. She is particularly drawn to projects that allow a deep dive into character development and its idiosyncratic, subtle, and sometimes perversely fascinating beauty. Kita spent the first 18 years of her life in Southern Manitoba and was therefore intrigued by the opportunity to investigate the culture um, that was at the same time familiar to her, yet still enigmatic, like the Mennonite community for the women, for the movie Women Talking. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kita Alfred. Hi, everyone. Hi, Kita. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this Thank evening. Thank you. My pleasure. My You're pleasure. all the way across the country. <laughs> I am. It's starting to get cold here. I saw, um, hello, Sydney, Australia. Whoever's in Sydney, Australia, I used to live there. I'm very jealous <laughs> that you're there and very happy that you're with us tonight. And everyone yes. else. Hi. Thank you. And they're heading into their summertime, so they're nice and warm. <laughs> Lucky ducks. So thank you for joining us this evening um, for all of us around the world to talk about a really interesting, fascinating community of women. As I mentioned in the introduction, I don't know very much about these women, particularly how it is that they work in their community and, and are able to dress themselves. And you have done a deep dive uh, into this and we look forward to hearing all about how it is that you brought these costumes uh, to life on screen. Well, speaking of being unfamiliar with the, the culture, Kevin, I, as, as you mentioned in your very lovely introduction, thank you, I grew up in southern Manitoba. I, I've lived in Toronto for almost 40 years now, which is a big city. But growing up, I was familiar with Mennonite culture on a surface level. Uh, my neighbors, my friends, my teachers, my, you know, acquaintances or Mennonite, Mennonite, the Mennonite culture is very big part of Manitoba. Um, but what I found out when I began my research for this, uh, I, I thought I knew, just like I thought we all think we know a lot about other people that we see, right. you know, but I really didn't. I, it, it's not at all unusual in Winnipeg, for example, where I grew up, to see women dressed as they are in our film, like you see on your screen right now, in a grocery store or in a fabric store or in a Walmart. So though they obviously, if they're in those places, aren't as traditional as the women in our film, but it's not an unfamiliar sight at, at all. So I thought I had a, an acquaintance with Mennonite culture. Are they but familiar, I really didn't. these individuals, when you're out in your world, you know, kind of doing your daily activity? Are, do they keep to themselves? Or are no. they friendly and, you know, no. interact? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely they are. But um, as I said, the, the 
the people, men and women, you, you see men and women everywhere in southern Manitoba dressed like they are in our film. Um, no, they're very outgoing. In fact, people often, uh, I mean, other people from other cultures interact with them quite often because they often sell goods. They sell um, produce or meat or eggs or um, they do excellent carpentry. The, the Mennonites are excellent, excellent carpenters and builders. So there's very often that uh, other cultures interact with uh, Mennonite colonies, perhaps not as quite as uh, conservative as ours in the film, but absolutely they are um, forthcoming. Of course, <clears throat> excuse me, of course they still maintain their own beliefs and their own customs, but our, um, our community in the film is much more conservative and much more secluded than the people I would see in a Walmart that's 10 minutes from my house. Right. So um, as is the way with anything in Southern Manitoba, in particular, ca Canadians are kind of like this anyway, but in Manitoba, everybody is from somewhere else except our indigenous people who have been there for 10,000 years. But everybody, recognizes and uh, appreciates each other's culture for the most part. Uh, so in Southern Manitoba, every, I always say people are two phone calls away. You're never more than two phone calls away from somebody you need to talk to. <laughs> and I was graciously let into a world that I thought I knew through the kindness and generosity and open heartedness of people in the Mennonite community that uh, introduced me to vendors and to makers, to manufacturers, to products, to history and family genealogies that I would not otherwise have had access to. And it was a really, really wonderful experience, that part of it in itself. I really love doing research and I had the luxury of lots of time to do it on this film. I. Uh, however, also not however, and in doing all of that wonderful research, I met such wonderful people, and I have made what I, who people I feel will be lifelong friends for me. I hope they will be uh, through well, the generosity of the of the community that I was investigating. Our, our viewers who don't know about women talking, um, it's a film that's just coming out that was um, directed by Sarah Polly. And it is about a group of women who are in an isolated religious community. And they must really kind of grapple with the reconciliation of, of an often brutal reality of their lives with their faith. And uh, the film has an incredible cast that stars Rooney Mara, Claire Foy, uh, Jesse Buckley, Judith Ivey, Ben Wishaw, and Frances McDormand. Um, had you worked with Sarah Polly before or with any of these other actors before? I hadn't worked with any of the actors. That was a, a really wonderful surprise. I worked with Sarah 30 something years ago wow. on the road to Avonlea when she was the star of the show. Uh, it was a series, Canadian series, mm -hmm. um, based on maybe some people are familiar with it, sort of associated with the, with the Anne of Green Gables stories. Right. Uh, and I was the assistant costume designer for a while on that series. So I knew Sarah from then um, and then had to watch vicariously for the next 30 years while she blossomed into this, the amazing artist and woman and feminist and activist that she is. And nobody was surprised that that happened because she's, since I knew her as a child, she was always a brilliant, bright spark amongst others and uh, is one of the smartest people I know. But I hadn't heard from Sarah in 30 years. And when I got the initial email from Lynn Luchabello, our Toronto producer, and then a phone call from Sarah, I kind of thought I was being punked because I <laughs> hadn't, hadn't heard from Sarah in 30 years. I just watched vicariously, but it turned out to be true. And then when she did, uh, she uh, and also Miriam Taves is, has long been one of my favorite authors and I'm a bit of a fangirl so the, all my worlds collided when when I got these emails and calls 
Um, was it because that they knew that you lived within, yeah. you know, a throws stone's nope. throw of, of the communities and figured a, you might have some, inter have had interaction with them and understood the community or and their dress? Not at all. Sarah oh. didn't even know I was from Winnipeg. No. And I just happened wow. to be in Winnipeg when we first heard our, our Zoom meeting and we, you know, we started to talk. I said, you know, I'm a huge fan of Miriam's work and one of my on my bucket list is to one day meet her because she's from 45 minutes down the road. I was sitting looking out my living room window when I was talking to Sarah and I said, you know, I'm in Winnipeg. She said, what? I said, I'm in Winnipeg. In, I grew up in Winnipeg. She said, I didn't know that. I said, I'm looking at Harold Friesen's house right now. My neighbor who's across the street. You can't swing a cat and not hit a Mennonite in my neighborhood. <laughs> And she had no idea, none whatsoever, that I was from Winnipeg, that I knew anything about Mennonites, that I had access to people who were Mennonite and had, uh, you know, access to resources. None of that. It, it was one of the millions of serendipitous things that happened to make this such a fantastic experience. That is astounding. I mean, it just seems almost unbelievable that, you know, it was your community growing up and then all of these years later, but as you say, serendipity, sometimes it's a miraculous thing that comes together. And when you find the right person or somehow you're channeling that right person and you don't know why, but obviously Sarah was. I agree. And ironically too, I had just been passed over for a, a series that was about my culture and about my family history and I heard nothing from them and then I got this call from Sarah so it, it was quite hilarious in in well hilarious but not surprising because things like that happen to us all the time on this show it was in in the best possible way can you describe how you navigated the research project process even though you've been in the community you've you're, you're familiar with the this group of women but that's not focusing on their dress and having to create character uh, from people that you know on the street, but you may not know them, but yet we have to get to know each of these characters. How do you do that? And how did you, how was your research process? Well, as I said, I was given access with literally two phone calls through a colleague, through then the colleague's family to people in Southern Manitoba. Uh, and, um, the I had two women who were my cultural consultants, Marianne Hildebrand in Winkler, Manitoba, and a good friend of hers, a longtime friend of hers, Esther Jansen in St. Clements, Ontario, which is closer to Toronto. Um, and both women have worked in social work and social mm -hmm. services for years and years. And they're modern, they're Mennonite by faith, but also by culture, but they're as modern as you and I are. Um, my mom was also a social worker and a probation officer for 30 years. So there was that connection initially for us beginning to talk. But then they, those two angels, connected me with people who lived more traditionally than they did uh, and who opened their homes and their hearts and their brains and their businesses to me. Um, so I learned... And plus, uh, because I was so close to Mennonite country, I did a lot of thrifting and uh, research library work and and I had access to um, periodicals and and other paper, I would say, because very little of it was online, my my research. Most of it was was oral history and uh, books. So I had ac easy access to those kind of documents. The, the Mennonite culture is very, very proud and um, pride, proud in the best way, not proud as in prideful, but um, they take great pleasure in recording their genealogy and their history and maintaining their history uh, through you know, oral history, written, uh, photographic, etc. So once I had, um, once I had some connections in order to meet people, I could delve deeper into personality, into uh, you know what the more traditional women would and wouldn't do. So, at, like firsthand accounts. Did you <laughs> shop for the textiles that you you know made the dresses from? Where the Mennonite women would actually shop, or uh, exclusively. You know? 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I had access to that. The only, I won't, that, that's not quite true. The only fabric in the, both men and women, we had it, originally there were a lot more men in the film and mm -hmm. uh, through the edit that the, the focus changed, but um, the only fabric that isn't directly from a Mennonite store or vendor is the is male's dress and when you all see the film you will you will know who I'm talking about um and that was a piece of fabric from Marshall Fabric in Winnipeg that but is connected to us to they have a whole separate section that sells nothing but fabric for Mennonite and Hutterite communities and through a colleague of mine who worked at this fabric store, I got gained access to the other side, to the colony store, they, they call it. Yeah, there's mail there. Right. And Sarah and I just fell in love with that piece of fabric and decided it needed to be in the movie, that it's as simple as that. Um, and ironically, it's the only dress that is rayon. At the rest are 100% polyester. It's the only one that ever moved while we were filming or <laughs> changed. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that because looking at the garments, they look like they're made of printed rayon. No, uh, but they're, this they're one is. polyester. Okay. 100%. And that is culturally accurate for several reasons. For reasons of mostly practicality. In mm -hmm. my experience, uh, the Mennonite community is eminently practical. Uh, frugal resourceful so polyester and, and also because in the more remote communities in central and south america not so much in um, in canada anymore but in some remote places that's all you can get right. and that's all they can get and but then even then there are vendors who are not mennonite that specialize in selling the kind of goods that the mennonite communities want because they buy in huge quantities mm -hmm. And you'll see in our film several times there are several family family members dressed in the same fabric or very close to the same fabric, and that's because um, they buy they don't just buy for their own family or their own you know themselves. Oh, I think I'll go and make myself a new pretty purple dress. The community goes and buys hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meters because they get a good price on it for one thing, right. but also because they have a lot of uh, people to to clothe but also because of the community communal nature of their of their community colony is it also because of the pleats i mean these dresses have a lot of pleats so i would think a a, a polyester fabric would help to set those pleats in versus you know a, a, a rayon chalet you would be yes. forever continually pleating yes. those dresses over and over yes and and you can talk to our costume crew who is in the <laughs> office during the filming of this and ask them about pleats um and polyester versus rayon i got accused by sarah of being a, a method costume designer because in the beginning i went thrifting in southern manitoba at where you can walk into just about any thrift store and see dresses similar to this, which seems impossible. You know, we, we joke and film some producer, a director said, well, can't you just run out? You know, they changed the mind. Can't you just run out and get a spacesuit? And we say, yeah, oh yeah, of course, give me, give me 10 minutes. I'm just going <laughs> to run to the spacesuit store and I'll be right back with exactly what you need. But in this case, there were times when we just could run out and get a sample of, of uh, you know, something similar of, to what we needed to play with and to adjust and to, to use as reference. Um, so I thought to myself, okay, what would a woman who has 10 children, probably under 15, possibly, if that's even physically possible, right? she's a farm wife. She works from dawn till dusk. She's in a hot climate. Why on earth would she want a long sleeve polyester dress? Before I knew the the more cultural aspects of the of plain dress as a term, not as a dress that's plain, but of a way of dressing and living simply and modestly. And so I bought a few that are not, they weren't specifically Russian Mennonite, the first ones I got, like the ones in our film. But I then I put them on and I all became clear, funnily enough they're all they're very practical you can move the pleats allow you to have a huge range of movement if you're out in the sun or you're doing something dirty or you're milking a cow or you 
your sleeves keep the dirt off you it keeps mm -hmm. the, they keep the sun off you you're covered and uh the the only thing that all of us still find perplexing is that there are no pockets in those dresses and imagine being uh, again for very cultural uh and faith-based reasons um, imagine being a woman with 10 children and no pockets for a soother or the keys to your barn right. or anything. Right. So thinking, um, thinking largely about the, the entire production, um, you did men as well as women, but what was the, what was the full kind of size of the cast, not just the stars, but you know, what were you coming into and did you have to create everything from scratch or were you able to go out and acquire some already so true Mennonite garments to be able to incorporate those into um, anything that you built? Well, we built the principal cast mm -hmm. um, based on ideas that uh, through my research I had found out because of course they're in virtually one thing for the whole film. So they needed multiples. For those right. of you listening that aren't in film, even though it's one thing, that mean, that one thing is being filmed over two or three months. So imagine that polyester dress after two weeks, never mind three months. So we had multiples that look exactly the same so that we could switch them out in order to launder the other ones in case of a stunt. So we needed more for stunts in case of a, a tear or something. Right. And uh, they were all very specifically designed. And I'll talk a little bit more about the, the character traits that we incorporated for each character within very narrow parameters. Um, but to your other question, Kevin, I have 531 real Mennonite dresses and wow. about 200 pairs of Schlaubexen, which are <laughs> the, which is the word for uh, overalls in Rubbermaid bins in Winnipeg, waiting for maybe another exhibit <laughs> right. or rental or something. But I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of hats and prayer coverings and all pieces because I acquired them as part of my kit and then made them available to the production so that we could start a little bit earlier than um, wow. the scheduled prep was. But if anybody needs a polyester dress, <laughs> I'm complete. your girl. Hit me up on Instagram. <laughs> right. So it sounds like it was actually then perhaps... Um, I'm not going to say easier, but you were able to get a, literally a jump start on the type of costumes for this production before the production commenced because you are so limited with basically an almost one off design that is replicated in different slightly different fabrics and in different patterns is that correct and then different sizes almost like small medium and large no no not small medium or large no each each of the principles and then I believe there are eight all together in the barn seven or eight and then there's august mm -hmm. um what we had was reference just like anybody i just had to ha happen to have physical reference okay. um rather than uh, paper or online reference um we used the the real ones for background we had lots and lots of background um but what we did was then take elements from various real dresses um, for the manufacture of them for one thing because they're a little bit more complicated than they look uh, underneath again for practical cultural reasons and then um, because in a community as as traditional as ours in the film is the, they, the women have very very few ways to express themselves mm -hmm. And the work on their dresses and the fabrics they choose and the styles that they choose within those parameters were virtually the only way that we could express character. We couldn't add earrings. We couldn't add lace. We couldn't add a, throw them in a ball gown. We couldn't give them four inch heels. So initially, after reading Miriam's book and then reading Sarah's script, what I found helped me was to divide the families the three families the Lowens, which is Ona that you see here um, and Salome who is Claire's character and Agatha their mother is Ju Judy Ivy Judith Ivy and little I always get the girls families mixed up Nietzsche belonged to that family they were the Friesens 
I think I call them loans. They are the Friesens. And then we have um, Greta, Sheila McCarthy, and uh, Jesse Buckley's character, Marike, and Mail, who you saw with the rayon dress, and Auche. And they are the Lowen family. And then we have the Scarface Jan family, which is um, Jan's, uh, Francis McDormand's character. Mm -hmm. So instinctively, because of their reactions in the book and the script, I the ideas that came to me were, uh, first of all, color groupings. So the Friesens to me were, uh, their reactions were more in the intellectual realm, whereas the Lowens to me were more in the instinctive realm. So the Friesens became purer colors like blues and purples, excuse me, and uh, repetitive, even patterns uh, with kind of forward motion. It's not literally forward motion, but in my mind, there was a, a, a regularity to them and a clearness to them. Whereas the low ones with, um, you'll see the three ladies on the, the four actually, the four on the left of the screen um, were more uh, instinctive in their reactions to, to their own lives and to the conversation. So to me, what represented them for me was uh, more natural colors, the world of the natural world, blue. Uh, I always start with blues because I've just said it. Uh, okay. Greens and browns and rusts and less regular patterns. You'll see Marike's dress in the front here. Where she's got her hand on her knee. That piece of fabric I picked up long before I'd ever met anybody because I instantly thought of Marike's character because of its murkiness and its swirliness and its indecision. It's, it spoke of indecision to me. Um, and you'll notice that her bodice is very simple. And I mean, they're not really adorned in any way except for snaps at the shoulder. But um, once those of you who haven't seen the film have seen, I won't spoil anything, but um, she's got a lot of challenges in her life. And to my mind, in my mind, she didn't have time for even the slightest bit of frippery or for uh, uh, self-care. Uh, the other women have fussier, more regular uh, expressions of their work, and it would be their own work. In reality, these women would make their own clothes and those of their daughters and those of their husbands and their mm -hmm. sons. Mm -hmm. So those bodices were, and the colors that we chose for them were the only subtle way really that we had to differentiate the families, uh, differentiate character expression. So, and then the Jans family, which is Francis's character and her two daughters, and there are some background performers also in her family uh, that you'll see in several scenes, but because their reaction, well, Scarface's anyway, was so tied to tradition and immovability. What spoke to me for them was the colors, colors of rust and dried blood and mm. age, ancient, uh, immovable things. And in our film, uh, I, I can't remember if it's actually in, in Miriam's book, but in our film, uh, Scarface is a seamstress. And so the, her, her bodice work, I wanted to be quite fussy, almost in a prideful way, and which is the exact opposite of what plain dress is meant to do. It's meant to negate the flesh, to eliminate pridefulness and ostentation in one's life, and not just in one's per physical person, but in one's mind, in one's practice of their faith. But there was something about scar, something almost um, uh, hypocritical to me. So I gave Francis a lot of detail and, and show offy kind of details in her, in her costumes. Um, but yes, dividing the families into color helped us, Sarah and me, but also helped the actors and me determine what uh, what we could do to differentiate character. And then I had individual conversations with each of them that where we went even deeper than color and pattern and detail, we went into body augmentation or restriction to, to give the actors 
an idea of what it felt like to have 10 children, what it felt like to be a farm wife that worked in the sun for, you know, 30 of the 35 years she's been alive. So there were a lot of things, there are a lot of things going on under these dresses that the audience doesn't see, but that are very, very important to character and to portrayal of character and to um, the subliminal feeling of, of how characters express, the actors express their characters. I think the use of color was brilliant on your part. You. I mean, especially because you are so limited, it is yeah. not something that you can just kind of take one of the, the women and suddenly make her so very different because that would not be correct. Um, yeah. What about what's going on underneath? Did you have to create undergarments and things to help um, minimize the body in ways you know you know the, the, the not the push-up bras and you know wonder would, bras but almost like the opposite are they maximize are they... is what i would say there <laughs> there was a lot of maximizing going on because again these women our, our women our cast our amazing mm -hmm. cast had not had 10 children had not worked all their life on a farm so we augmented a, uh, quite a bit and I will never tell you who did what, but you may sense it. If you know, if are, are familiar with the actor's work, you, you may know. Um, and then we also used a certain amount of restriction to, to, to give a sense of the limitations in this very conservative culture. And, and also, for example, to, I, I saw in my research a lot of examples of... Um, stomach binders to to like literally keep your abdomen in place after your 15th child right you know so there was a sense of of that too a couple of the um actors wanted that feeling of barely being able to keep themselves together physically so they wanted help like pulling their body back together sort of to experience that feeling of this could all just come tumbling down like a Jenga tower at, at any point. So yeah, the, the stuff that's underneath is, is in my mind almost as important as the stuff that's outside. And, and here we're seeing Rooney's character, Ona, mm -hmm. um, a little tip or a little um, something, a detail of, of her character, for example, is that in very, very traditional Mennonite colonies, there is no such thing as maternity wear. You, you just, because it draws attention to the, to the body, which is very much not part of their culture, any sort of uh, self, I won't say self-reflection, but drawing attention to one's body, especially uh, in matters that are sexually, rela sexually related. Mm -hmm. um, so you just hike that band, you, you wear the same dress that you've worn for 15 years, unless you've had a chance to make a new one, just hike it over the bump. And so consequently, you'll see um, on a slip showing almost through the entire film. It's because that that's the reality of pregnancy in these very traditional communities is that no, you don't get any special dispensation for pregnancy. It's a something that happens over and over and over again. And right. we just carry on. We don't draw any attention. And I'll just mention one more detail about the pregnancy. The, all of these dresses snap at the left corner. You, you can't see me. I'm pointing to the screen now, like you guys can see me doing that. But um, you'll see the sketch, the illustration on the left. On the left shoulder are three snaps, generally two or three snaps. That piece of pleated bodice comes away at the shoulder. It's attached at the right shoulder and comes away at the left. And underneath is a, a snap front blouse, essentially, a bodice so that um, in a very conservative, very um, body, uh, what's the opposite of, <laughs> not body negativity, but um, they're very, very- Body, you know- uh, Averse, I'll yes. say. So right. that you could nurse a child discreetly uh -huh. under, under a dress like that. And as I found out in my research, you wouldn't do that in front of your sisters even. You would certainly wouldn't do it in front of your other children. You wouldn't do it in front of a group of women in a barn, for example, like, like our women in. There would be a blanket over top of your child. You would be in private nursing. Imagine trying to do that when you've got maybe three kids who are still nursing. 
So the practicality of these dresses, once that was revealed to me, I, I had so much more respect for the whole process and also for plain dress in general. It's mm -hmm. certainly as a secular modern woman of a different culture, I, they were mystifying to me. But once I started to learn about the historical and the cultural reasons behind all of them, for example, the 500 years of the Mennonites movement through Europe, through Northern Europe, from the Netherlands to Poland, to Russia, to Ukraine, into Southern Europe, that's where all of these details that have been distilled down over 500 years came from, the florals, the puff sleeves from the Dutch, the pleated detail, the pleated skirts, the aprons, the hats, all of that. And um, here you'll see Sheila's, uh, who's Greta, on the far right, her nighty, which in the, in the actual communities are just made out of old curtains or old sheeting or any of that because they're imminently practical, practical people who waste nothing. Right. So no fabric even goes to waste. There is a scene where uh, one of the women is wearing uh, her slip. It's interesting to see that, that uh, or is it the nightdress? The nightdress. Well, it's wearing. the same thing. The same she's thing. Sleep in okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one garment. So essentially, I mean, some women have more than one dress and perhaps more than one slip. But that's it. You don't have lingerie. You don't have nightgowns. You don't. This slip goes under. That there's Ona again. That slip is worn under her dress, and at night and in the morning she'll get up and put her dress over top of her nighty, essentially. If, if we're thinking as modern women in particular, so there is no superfluousness at all, if that's a word, <laughs> if I'm using it correctly <laughs> in this case. To, to plain dress, it, it, is, it is specifically designed to negate pridefulness. Right. And hide, not hide the body, but- Display in, the body in a different way that is not something that is an LA body. No, not even, I wouldn't use the dis word display even, Kevin, because mm -hmm. it's meant to negate and uh, negate the body. Is it also meant to negate the personality? This is my subjective uh, answer. Uh, yes, in, in my research, evidence is, is that yes, that because the- You are community, not an individual. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect example. Yes, it is to remind one of one's place. And, and this applies to the men's uh, clothing as well. But the women have so many more limitations on their lives, as we see in the movie, than the men do. Um, yes, it is to remind one of one's place under God, under one's husband, under one's family, uh, and to dispel any sense of individuality uh, it, in a, in a faith-based way, in a in a way where attention is meant to be focused on worship and, and on faith rather than mundane things. Did any of the actors make comments to you either when they were in their fitting processes or once they were on set about how their costumes really affect them moving, acting, getting into character? Um, you know, so many actors I've heard talk about if they're doing, you know, an 1880s uh, movie and they put on that corset and all of a sudden, you know, it really changes their posture. It's a different, very different yeah. way of having to stand as than we do now. H how about, how about this? I mean, uh, with being a part of a community, losing your identity, being an actor, trying to find your character and everybody's dressed alike. You've got subtle details, but did any of the actors ever give you or come and cry on your shoulder? <laughs> Every last one of them. Every last one of them. These simple, seemingly simple dresses, I, I've sometimes described them as a cross between uh, an acting exercise and a therapy session. The, the reactions to them ran the entire spectrum of any kind of reaction you can imagine. And uh, to some, they were freeing that that freedom of not being looked at for your size, for your beauty, for your celebrity, 
was freeing to some no makeup no nothing like they're they're you you're it's you in the mirror and that's it it's all you know it's it was close to kind of being naked for <laughs> for some right. some because of perhaps things that had nothing to do with the costume or the film or the script or their character reacted in very different ways it, it, they were very confrontational these dresses uh, because of what they represented in many cases, uh, for some because of the polyester and the reality of that, right? Um, th there was no place to hide it really in these dresses, although funnily, some found them the perfect place to hide. Uh, they were very, very confrontational and the, the fittings were fascinating and amazing and I got reactions right to the last day. And there were some times where uh, when the actors would fight and fight and fight against this, but but beautifully put that into their character. That, that uh, discomfort was put into their character. And then I, I received a beautiful email months after from one of the cast that said, I didn't get it at the time, but I just had a screening of the film and thank you so much. Wow. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Um, it, it, they were hard. They were really confrontational, these dresses, because of what they represented. But every last one of them used that in their character. The young girls, for example, Kate and Liv, I believe it was their first professional fitting for both of them, I think. Wow. I could be wrong. It, one of their first, anyway. And to them, these were pretty puffy pleated dresses that were cute and swung, you know, spun, when, swung around when you spun. So they had a completely different perspective, in some cases, to the older women. So it was it was really fascinating. Did any of the uh, cast keep their dresses afterward? Michelle, who is male, has got one. Um, she's got one of those, those rayon ones. Mm -hmm. I don't know what she does with it. I mean, she's going to, she's <laughs> she might go to auditions in it or something, but <laughs> she, she loved that. Um, I'm sure there were a number that would like to throw them in a heap and burn them. <laughs> um, but that didn't happen while I was watching anyway. Uh, no, I think Michelle's the only one that kept one. But and all the rest of them, except for the ones that were in your beautiful exhibit and that are used for the theater exhibits are in Rubbermaid bins in my storage space in Winnipeg, waiting to be released into the world. What about the head wraps? Is there anything very specific about the head wraps? Yeah, those are prayer. So a married woman wears a prayer covering. As soon oh. as you're even engaged, never mind married, you would put on it and then this our community is very specifically russian mennonite there are various there are variations on Ru russian mennonite garb some of the women wear a little i sometimes call it a bun warmer it looks like a little net mm -hmm. on the back um a snood or something yeah almost like a snood um our community in the communities in bolivia for the most part and southern manitoba and uh Mexico, Belize, uh, Paraguay, for example, wear a prayer covering, which is a simple piece of black cloth. In, in our case, it's black. Some communities wear white or lace. Um, and it is donned once a woman is betrothed or married, which is why Ona is an anomaly because she's in her mid thirties, she's pregnant. So she has obviously known a man. Mm -hmm. um, but she refuses to put on the prayer covering, which is a symbol of, uh, again, my subjective opinions come in. It, it's a symbol of marriage and it's a symbol of um, your place under your husband right. and under God. And you're, both you and your husband are under God and the wife is under the husband as far as hierarch fam familial hierarchy goes. Um, so Ona should, because she's pregnant, and in many real life communities would be forced essentially to wear a 
a prayer covering, but she's just got her braids like the younger girls, and but hers are covered in a hair net, which is also traditional for for sort of teen girls, sometimes the younger young ones too, to put over their beautiful braids. Um, you'll see there that uh, Salome, Claire's character, has a prayer covering on, and the women even wear them when they sleep. Oh, wow. In, wow. in their, yes, because they are never to be mm. away from God. And I, I'm assuming never... it's a sign also for any guy who is out maybe looking for a wife to say, oh, sh her head is not covered. She Absolutely. must be available. Absolutely. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Yes, exactly right. Um, now, are, are these communities, do you know, because we're talking about the Russian Mennonites and I've also heard of the Swiss Mennonites. Yeah. Um, do, do any of these communities kind of ever overlap? Were you able to bring in um, some aspects of various Mennonite communities or is this one very, very specific? No, it's very, very specific. And um, that was out of respect to Miriam's work and to Sarah's and to the culture because I had been let into the heart of a of a culture that is normally quite closed, I wanted to be as accurate as possible mm -hmm. and res as respectful as possible. And although the communities in Canada, for example, of course they do interact. In fact, there's there are stores near, where is it, Wallenstein, Ontario, which is southwest of, of Toronto, that the store is run by Russian Mennonites who are similar to the women in our film, but they are patronized by Swiss Mennonites, which are the mm. predominant Mennonites in that area. And they look very, if any of our audience is old enough to remember Holly Hobby, <laughs> yes, they, right, right. their look is very, like they actually wear bonnets. I, I right. sometimes take umbrage when people refer to the bonnets in our, in our film, because our women do not wear bonnets. They wear straw hats or they wear prayer coverings, but Swiss Mennonites that are this particular version of Swiss Mennonites in Southern Ontario, absolutely wear the Holly Hobby bonnet and long, long dresses to the ankle, mm -hmm. usually black capes or shawls over top, held together with straight pins. Um, sometimes very similar to sometimes women who wear hijab use straight pins as well, rather than safety pins. Um, and I think that has to do with the level of technology involved in a safety pin as opposed to a straight pin. Uh, uh -huh. um, but yes, the, the cultures do absolutely uh, interact, but I did not. Our costumes are 100% accurate out of respect to the community that I was portraying. How was it working with the community? Did you, were you um, out and were Mennonites watching filming? Were they, you know, how was that interaction and was there any? Um, in my research and in my acquisition of goods, it was fabulous. My experience of the Mennonite community has always been one of kindness and generosity and service, helpfulness and graciousness. That, that has always been my experience ever, even before, long before I ever started to do any of this research. And that was absolutely the case once I was led into this world that I thought I knew, and in fact, I didn't. Um, the, many of the women, it, it's a, I don't know if it's, I would call it an unfortunate reality, but it's a reality that most of the women that helped me on this film will likely never see this film. Wow. For cultural reasons, because they simply don't go to films hmm. and they don't participate in too many uh, certainly modern cultural activities outside of their community um, so many of them will will never see it yet they were beyond gracious and helpful and kind and they were so excited that someone who wasn't of their culture was wanted to know more about it and, and wanted to explore it. And, and they were a little bit fascinated that I would be paying any attention to plain dress. That That is something that's so ubiquitous to them. It's everywhere, it's their whole life. So why would anybody else who doesn't live like us want to know about this? So there, we had some great conversations, especially with, I had some great conversations with young girls, 
Mm -hmm. I asked about plain dress and whether, you know, simple things like, are, are they hot in the summer, your dresses? Yeah. Or the, this is how we live. This is what I've always used known. To. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you talked about safety pins versus straight pins. I'm curious um, about the snaps. Um, are, are, are buttons used or is it specifically snaps? Maybe this is just a little too detail-y of a question, but I, I wondered. If... No, buttons are too prideful, Kevin. Buttons are too oh. fancy. There have been divisions oh. of churches over whether women are allowed to have buttons on their garments because they are too prideful. The snaps, again, like many of the communities, are utterly functional, utterly practical, utterly, uh, I, I wouldn't go so far as frugal because uh, these don't really have much to do with frugality, but it's, be, it's a cultural thing in that any other sort of ostentation is, is too prideful and therefore is eliminated. I will, now that we've got um, Ben's character, August, sitting here with the ladies, when I was finding out how to make these overalls, which I was graciously taught by a woman in Southern Manitoba, she explained that somehow someone had explained to her what all the specific pockets were for. And unfortunately, we don't see many men in our film, as many as we were meant to. But she even went so far as to tell me, like, this pocket is for your package of cigarettes. This one's for your pocket watch. This one's for a pen. And the other ones might be for keys. Like she, you know, there are details as specific as that. But the women have none of that. Um, they have their snaps because they're practical. Right. And they're... Uh, affordable and you'll see uh rooney's beautiful braids here yes um traditionally the young women have the braids done. they don't cut their hair because hair is is part of god's glory and not to be messed with um so in one of the very 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 few places that they display any sort of um ostentation isn't even the right word but it uh, is in their braiding and in the use of yarn in their hair um but even that is is kept within certain parameters it's it's yet yeah, it's a form of of handiwork essentially those beautiful braids just like the the different bodices on their dresses or or perhaps the embroidery on some of the prayer coverings which is still dark but it's you know beautiful you know, some of it's beautifully hand done. And it gives us a little bit more of a sense of an individual, at least. Yeah. 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 Very, very, very few places where uh, the women in particular are allowed to express right. that. Mm -hmm. Now, did you, did you wear the dress? Did you yourself experience it? I did. I did for a while. In fact, <laughs> while I was, uh, while I was researching mm -hmm. for many reasons, practical reasons, uh, functional reasons to figure out how they were made, how they would work, what we could do, what the actors would be able to do in them. But then on the second or third day of filming, I put one on uh, and went to set. And this is before, because I had been working mostly in the office in prep and with the actors, most of the crew had no idea who I even was. <laughs> and there is this crazy woman with curly hair rolling around in the dirt on set while they're setting up for some stunt everybody looked at me like I had lost my ever-loving mind they, they thought I was a stand-in or a stunter or something and they right. kind of you know shushed me out tried to push me out of the way I'm, I kept I kind of kept stum, you know but uh yeah I I went hard for a little while there because yeah. <laughs> I wanted to see what would brush off what wouldn't right how we need what we needed research to do in, in, yes in the you know in the breakdown of these dresses if if anything and it turns out those things are titanium those polyester <laughs> dresses just like you put them besides rolling around in the dust which is another reason that the women wear them because you just go oh there okay yeah, yeah. And there's now there's no dust on my dress but you put them into a washing machine and half an hour later you pull them out and they look exactly the way they did when they went in right so yes i i wore them and i have immense respect for plain dress and, and for people who live very busy 
very strenuous lives in plain dress. Right. It well, is. we only have a few minutes left. And I wonder what, looking back on the whole production, pre-production, production, anything post-production, what, what you found to be the most challenging aspect of this project? Oh, there, there wasn't much that was, to be honest, because it, it was one of the most hugely collaborative situations I've ever, th that I've ever worked on, many of us. Uh, the heat, maybe, was a challenge with the polyester mm -hmm. for many reasons. Right. Um, but otherwise, it, it's, it was a dream experience. It was fantastic. We, we had such support from everyone that it, it made it all, even the challenging stuff was made easy. Um, we have one question uh, from that's come in from our viewers. This is Nathan. Um, and he, he is very complimentary about the aspect of, of coming up with character and you know, working on set and so forth. Um, he's also interested in, you know, as a costume designer on a, on a movie, the dealing with the business side of the film production, you know, specifically how that a costume designer deals with the, you know, the studio and coming up with a budget. Um, we don't have much time, but I was wondering if there was anything specific about this film that was outside of the norm of any other type of film that you have worked on um, uh, when it comes to the business side of, of movie making. Well, funnily enough, what I will say is again a little bit of what I said before is that this. I had so much support and so much respect for my work. I was given so much respect for my work that this was not the norm. Unfortunately, this experience was not the norm. I'm used to ridiculous negotiations, uh, both financially and uh, artistically. I'm used to having my research questioned. I'm used to having my budgeting, absolutely having my budgeting questioned. And this was such a supportive environment that it was unusual. Um, but those things mostly come through experience and, uh, and self-confidence. I've, I've always been a bossy gal. So <laughs> that I don't, I don't mind negotiating. And I also don't mind, uh, I won't go so far to, as to call it confrontation because it, it shouldn't get that far, but I don't mind discussion and, um, and uh, expressions of opinions both ways. Um, but that sort of, stuff comes from experience and from talking to each other and asking what each other what each other everybody makes share your rate because we make less than most of the other departments and we do a lot more work than some of the other departments so share information do not be uh do not withhold information from each other share and help each other Ita, I think we're going to end it on that very positive note, a uh, very collaborative note. I yeah. thank you so much for joining me uh, here at uh, the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising and in our galleries uh, at the FITA Museum uh, for tonight's discussion about a very interesting film, Women Talking. And I thank all of our viewers for joining us around the world tonight for uh, Zooming in with us to, to hear uh, a firsthand account about a very interesting topic, very interesting women, and the challenges that these characters within the film have had to go through, but also the challenges that you took to bring this uh, to life. And I'm still astounded that it is from your very own community and how that worked out together. It, it is very serendipitous. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin, for having me. I'm sorry to the audience that I blabbed so much I, and, and didn't have time for your questions. Um, you can find me on Instagram if you want to send me a message and ask me a question. I love to talk about this film, so I would be happy to answer more questions. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Have a good evening.